So, um, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all here today to the Betty and John Soren Gallery here at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. My name is Anne Rose Kitagawa. I'm Chief Curator of Collections and Asian Art here. And it is my very great privilege to introduce somebody who I think practically every single one of you already knows on a first name basis, <laughs> um, Professor Ina Asim, um, Associate Professor of uh, Chinese, what do they call it? Like Chinese pre-1850. Uh, pre-modern Chinese history. So a distinguished sinologist from Germany, one of those overeducated Germans who has two PhDs, um, who is a specialist not just in uh, Chinese history, but with a special emphasis on Chinese material culture and textiles. And um, since I am responsible for Asian art here, I can just say that this gallery has been kind of the beating heart of this museum. Gertrude Best Warner, our founder, went to Asia in 1903 and lived in Shanghai, had a houseboat on the Yangtze River, and was able to collect Chinese art, especially of the Qing Dynasty, the like of which we could not possibly afford today. Um, this is an amazing legacy collection, and it's wonderful that we're able to present it um, in conjunction with a distinguished faculty member who, with whom it's always my pleasure to work. Like the process of working in the Japanese galleries with professors Akiko and Glenn Wally, um, working with Professor Asim allows not just me and this museum, but our students and the broader community um, access to the incredible brain trust of the faculty that we have at the University of Oregon. And you know, it goes without saying that the things that the faculty research about our collections are much deeper and more eloquent than anything that I would be able to say about them. Um, this particular exhibition draws strongly on Gertrude Best Warner's collection of textiles. And um, because Ina will not promote herself, I will promote her and say that she is one of three professors who currently have a Mellon grant to work between the library and the art museum on projects that um, sort of forefront collections that are hold, held by both institutions. And Ina's project has to do with Chinese textiles, Gertrude Best Warner's collection. So this is not exclusively a textile exhibition, it's focusing on Taoism, but as you will see, textiles play prominently in this uh, story. So with that, uh, Professor Ina Asim. Thank you, Anne. Way too much honor. Now I'm intimidated. <laughs> but thank you all for coming, because I know it's so beautiful outside, and the Queen Mother of the West would abduct you to her pond, to a nice banquet, and you are here. So I'm very honored. Well, most of you know this hall very well, and when it came to thinking about reinstalling what will go here, some of the old friends of the museum said, but the throne will be back, right? And we said, no. <laughs> we will use the space in a different way. And if you think about our topic, I can now welcome you to the Hall of Longevity, or the Hall of Immortality. And if you can get longevity or immortality, what do you need a throne for? <laughs> so after 85 years or something, we banned the throne for a while, and instead used the space to bring out some of the most spectacular textiles that haven't been shown together in this constellation ever before, correct? We have seen several, you know, several of these textiles from previous exhibitions, so one or the other showed up. The same is true for some of the paintings, but uh, to have this in this constellation is very unique. And the space that we needed to hang these long textiles is marvelous and we learned from the Barberini show, this is the tallest room and then we thought if Barberini can be here, let's bring out the fine tapestries. Barberini was nice, I don't deny, <laughs> but the tapestries made in Europe are made of wool. Now you can use the same technique, the same technology for a textile to make it very elegant 
comparatively light if we compare to those tapestries. And get this. I'm not very happy often with the translation tapestry weaving because immediately the association that we have in our mind is European tapestries. But what tapestry weaving is, is pictorial weaving. And to weave painting-like images, to weave pictures, is very difficult. So what is specific about several of our hangings is that they have a specific technique called ke se, ke se translated as cut silk or tapestry technique for Chinese silk. What this means when you think about technology, and by the way, I will just say this now, I'm not going to repeat myself all the time, so that anybody who uh, wants to come along can grab their chair and sit at a different location when we also have to move the camera. But then I will just refer to Kirsa. So bear with me right now, just for this short definition, and then we jump right into the imagery that we see here. So Kirsa tapestry weaving is a technique where the weaver, when it comes to such pictorial elements that are round, like trees, like rocks, or the human figure, uses a specific or uses one bobbin for each color, which means the weaver can put the weft entry at the location where it's needed and then return. So you do not have floating threads on the backside of the tapestry going to the next location where the next entry is needed, which means this takes an enormous amount of time to achieve this pictorial uh, um, effect. So when you think about the dark blue, I think that is best visible to everybody. It shows up here on the right side, then a little bit a third over, and then on the, red, on the right edge. And when you think about uh, standard weaving, then you could use a blue bobbin have it come to the surface where it shows here, go underneath, reappear, go underneath, float behind all the way till the color is needed again, come to the surface, and then disappear on the edge. But this is not done here. You have a finer imagery if you make individual entries with every um, with every weft thread, you also save a lot of material and the fabric is not as heavy. You can imagine if every color would float behind, then we couldn't really hang this up here. And this is what it was supposed to do. It was, it is a hanging in celebration of probably a birthday, a celebratory event, an anniversary, or such, just like these two hangings as well. How do we know this? The upper part that shows the character, the many characters, is actually the same character in a hundred different forms, always representing long life. And that is what connects us to our topic, Taoism. Many of you will say, well, where is actually the Taoist art and how is that defined? When some of the um, exhibition interpreters asked me to say something before the exhibition opened, one of them asked, so can you define Taoism? Define Taoism for me. And I said, no. <laughs> to define Taoism is a very dicey uh, enter uh, uh, entrepreneurial attempt because Taoism is philosophy. Taoism developed into a religion with several church-like institutions, very stratified, and has not stopped to develop since. 
So the mixture of Taoist philosophy, certain influences of shamanistic backgrounds, and also, as you will see, those of you who are trained and say, I know a lot about Buddhism, and I find Buddhist emblems here, or Buddhist symbols. Yes, Buddhism also had an influence on the development of the iconography and the symbolism. So, Taoism is a philosophy, and Taoism is a cultural system of symbols. And when then you also ask, why is there not more Taoist art in form of sculpture? A lot of what Taoism used as its expression is very ephemeral. So observing a Taoist ritual where a priest performs a ceremony is probably the most authentic way to see religion, philosophy, and art jointly in process. And so when we look at all the objects that Anne and I have selected, and this is most wonderful, I can't tell you how much fun I have to have Anne as the co-conspirator, because I'm a historian. She is the art historian, so if she heaps accolades on me, that's just to avert your view <laughs> from her because she's the one who really knows this collection inside out and then says, why don't we add this object or do you remember this wonderful cup? And I will point out her favorite objects to you as we go along. So a system, a cultural system of symbols is expressed in all of this, but some of these objects are more directed to a general public. And some of the objects, like the robes that we have here on the left side, are definitely objects that were used in Taoist ritual performances. And so we are very, very lucky that Gertrude Baswarner was able to secure three Taoist robes. There are collections that have fine Taoist robes and also may have several as we saw in the, in the big exhibition in Chicago. But to have three Taoist robes here, where you can see that this cultural system of symbols reappears, so the iconography you will find repeating itself. But the way it was artistically translated into these individual robes is very unique for each of them. So some of the, the, the symbols that you will see, as I mentioned, all of them have to do, or most of them have to do with long life or longevity. And Taoism in this sense is inspired by the search for longevity, ultimately immortality, through a life conducted in a way that it doesn't interfere with the inner nature of either outward sentient beings, objects, or your inner nature. When you look at statues or images of Taoist saints, if I may call them saints, revered masters, you will see that they don't have the very centered, or very often, the very centered, almost always in meditation, motionless expression of Buddhist saints, Buddhist Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Buddhist statues. Very often they are entirely quirky, as we will see when we look at our eight immortals. And that is not a contradiction to Buddhism, which of course celebrates self-cultivation with giving the, the guideline, reaching enlightenment through deep meditation and concentration, but by not interfering with anything that is the innate nature that 
a person, or for that matter, animate nature has. So thinking about the yokai. <laughs> and therefore, when we look at Taoist imagery, everything seems very individual, individualistic. And therefore also the great variety, although that's also true for many Buddhist robes, of the same iconography or recurrent iconography in very different execution. So looking again at our, our celebratory hangings, you will see that apart from the very intricate technology, there is also a plethora, a wealth of symbolism involved. So the figure at the top sailing in on a phoenix is the Queen Mother of the West. She is the Taoist ruler over the paradise in the far western mythical, not the, the, the actual geography, Kunlun Mountains. And she sails in to celebrate a banquet with people who uh, um, support her immortals who come to celebrate her birthday. This topic of the celebration we will see not only here, we will encounter this again as we proceed because it is the, the epitome of congratulating somebody to a high age to have achieved a long life, a life well lived, and uh, the, the, the celebration that it deserves is expressed in something like this, which could be given as a gift, in this case, of course, commissioned and done by experts. Other symbolism, when you look at the, aside from the uh, uh, assembly of saints, immortals, celebrating the Queen Mother of the West, are all of the accoutrements of a scholar. So that alludes very much to all of the achievements a, Taoist, a, a, a Confucian scholar should have. So you see these archaistic vessels on the side, and they remind of Confucian ritual. We have a case over here with vessels that were used for rituals in the Confucian, uh, with a Confucian background. And then symbols that reoccur that you will see again and again. And later, when we start to move around, I encourage you to get into the uh, mode of where is Waldo? So where are the cranes? Where are the deer that are all symbols of longevity? And you will see them in the most unlikely places, in decorative parts of hangings and paintings, or in the center, like when we look at the, the god of longevity on the back wall. What else do we have here at the bottom? The accumulation of deer looks like Eugene. And that is, of course, always keep in mind where we are. There, there is something to this that we have this year. So the deer. <coughs> in the Confucian context, are used as a symbol for a good emolument with a successful career as an official. In the Taoist context, they show you the way to the mountains. And when you go to the mountains, what are you searching for? You're searching for solitude, but you're also searching for the encounter with the mortals. And if this doesn't happen instantly, then you can also use your time to search for herbs, because a lot of the Taoist scholars, or Taoist inclined scholars, were interested in medicine and the use of herbs, which you, of course, find in the mountain. 
because one of the deeper topics of Taoism is transformation. Everything is in a flux, and transformation from unhealthy to healthy can be done with herbs. And if you know the processes in the body, as you observe the body, and know about the analogy in nature and the cosmos, then you will be on a good path to find the right herb to cure certain ailments. And what you can also find, and therefore pay attention to the deer, is the magic mushroom. So herbs to get along life and health, and the good mushroom to have a transformation in your mind. I know here in Eugene, the five-fingered plant is more <laughs> popular for doing this, but the magic mushroom inspired many of these uh, scholars and priests who went onto a um, inspired trip of vis visualization that was uh, set off with a good potion of the magic mushroom. So deer know where this magic mushroom lives. And sometimes you can see it on the Saturday market in Eugene. There is a guy who sells mushrooms, and he has a magic mushroom right to attract customers. <laughs> but uh, as we go along, you will see that the deer are masters in finding the mushroom, and they also enjoy it greatly. So I know the city of Eugene is not into feeding the deer, but follow the deer and let them feed you. Mm, maybe that works. Maybe we should go to the more serious side of the Taoist priest's vestments, and then we get all jolly because we will encounter lots of deer with magic mushrooms as we proceed to the eight immortals. So you... Oh yes, of course, more technology. So um, what may look like embroidery and is indeed labeled as kursa is woven imagery. Embroidery, of course, is a very meticulous work, as you know. And it's not something that you know, the ladies do in their free time. And they just have nothing better to do. To be a good embroiderer takes a lot. And the most exquisite embroidery is actually very nice to look at from both sides. Because it doesn't reveal that somebody was sloppy and hides little mistakes in the back. But of course, embroidery is the second best art to show pictorial imagery. Weaving is much more complicated, but um, embroidery is used widely as well, and it is extremely fine. So we have kursu and embroidery examples, and we also have an example, I think it's in the kusse, in the red kusse, right, where we have a little bit of painting added to give you the imagery that you were expecting, or that the artist wanted to show. By the way, if you have questions. Yes, we can I, I have a question. Knowing that this is a tapestry, and knowing that the bobbins contain, you know, they were the color. They would have the blue bob in here, here, and here. And since it's not taken out through the back, how is it, does it move from place to place? That's, that's a very good question. So if I could hold this up, then you would see, if I could shine a light from behind, which I can't because it's actually backed, and when I get too close it will also meep. But if I could hold a flashlight from behind, you would see where the thread returns. So instead of going all the way over, the weaver ta takes it back and back and back and makes sure that there are enough crossings that the slits 
that actually develop during this weaving technique because you will not always cross warp and weft. Don't get, don't become obvious. But if I would take the flashlight, you would see it. So a very, Anne always scolds me about this, but a very um, illustrative example would be to compare it with kalims. If you take a kalim carpet and hold it up, you see where the slits are, and that's exactly the same technique. The weft doesn't go through, it returns. And then the weaver goes to this side and puts in the bobbin at the very location where the color is needed. Excellent question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could achieve the imagery by embroidering it on top of the warp and only ever so slightly at certain times to, to give it a hold, use the warp thread, which is probably then also dyed at this location. It's just, it's just here. This is pure kasa. And if you now go to other museums, you will see this is very rare. Thank you, Gertrude Bass Warner. <laughs> she, she knew what she was getting into. And uh, as Anne sometimes mentioned, maybe one of the reasons why we have such exquisite textiles is also that a lot of the collectors at the time, I, in some ways, looked down on the art. Because they said, painting, following the dictum of the Chinese artists, calligraphy, art number one, painting, art number two, and then nothing, and then sculpture. <laughs> and then for a long time, some others, and then textiles. <laughs> Well, that's a very good question as well. So who wove? When we look at Chinese doctrine, it's always men plow and women weave. So women were in charge of everything in the house, including the weaving and the embroidery, etc. Well, ever since people started to look at this very closely, who produced weavings? At what rate? And who commissioned such pieces that were used either in very high-class households or for the palace. We know that the palace had imperial workshops that worked on an industrial scale, I could say. Not when we think about the steam engine, not Manchester and mass production as we know it after electrified uh, looms became possible, but surely before that. So when we think about the big state-run workshops that were set up in Nanjing and Suzhou and Hangzhou, etc., then you had hundreds or thousands, depending on which location, of looms with weavers. And who were the weavers is a great question, because we know once the quota of orders by the, by, the uh, uh, by the emperor or the imperial household grew to an extent that the workshops couldn't, w which were uh, uh, run by officials with quality control and you name it, they, they had this all, couldn't fulfill all the, the, the quota, or the orders. Private workshops then stepped in and that was the moment when men took over weaving and the separation of men work in the fields and sustain the state and the families, etc., with agricultural products and the women are at home and weave the tax silk, their own garments plus anything luxury that they were capable of doing. This 
changes dramatically. So in the 16th, 17th century, we have lots of weaving households where men weave. Embroidery is very much in women's hands, but we do have sources that also um, report about men embroidering. But that's not something that was um, systematically done by men on the scale like the transition in the weaving sector. So thinking about how a community that would participate or be the audience to a Taoist ritual would see these robes would be from the back. So if you want to see what I'm telling you, you have to come here. <laughs> or you have to look at the robe on the wall. These robes are long and wide. And when you imagine yourself being a priest and standing there with stretched out arms, you get an idea of how wide they are because they would more or less cover your hands or half of your palm. And the reason for that is that, of course, the audience that was looking at the priest from the back would see this iconography that repeats itself in a certain way, but as I mentioned previously, always in a very individual, individual for the, the artist that made the robe way. So you see that in the center, there is this kind of mandorla-like emblem, which is actually the Tower of the Immortals, the seat where the Immortals are thought to reside. And it's surrounded by discs. You see these golden discs. Those are the lunar mansions. And you see both of these emblems on all of the three robes and even our modern robe, the, the vest here to, to the right on the wall. What you also see and what is repetitive for all of the vests are emblems that look like Chinese characters or resemble Chinese characters but are not Chinese characters. Everybody who can read Chinese will say, hmm, this sort of looks like something like a character, but it isn't. So what is this supposed to mean? These are the symbols of the five sacred mountains of Taoism. Those are the mountains where you find Taoist monasteries and hopefully Taoist immortals and lots of deer, of course. What you also see is that each of these robes, these two, the one in the front, have a wealth of other symbols. The dragon indicating the, the force searching for the pearl of, or chasing for the pearl of knowledge, and the, uh, the emblems here around the center, also dragons embroidered in very, very rich, um, in a very rich fashion in medallions. You see also that just around the central mandorla, you again have the five sacred mountains symbols. So looking at a distance, you see the immortals, you see the sacred mountains and the ocean all together, a set of symbols that represent the cosmos. That's a big program. Well, it is a big program because a lot of the rituals that Taoist priests conducted were not conducted in temples, but the, the priest stepping into 
the robe, wearing the robe, would prepare the space where he would conduct the ritual and transform it, Taoism, the art of transformation, into a sacred space by setting up a temporary altar, probably imagery of the three most important deities, and start his ritual by invoking the, the deities who he wanted to ask for assistance to be present. He was sort of the, the conduit of bringing the forces of these deities down to the sacred space and acting with his assistance or his appeal in favor or in support of the person, the, the sick person, or the quest that was put forward to them to answer this favorably. I mentioned that the rope is white, covering the hands, and very long as well. Well, the paces that the priest would take would be accompanied by certain movements of his hands, and a lot of the meanings hidden in the movements that the, the priest conducted were secret. They were only known to priests who had achieved the same level of um, calling and initiation that this, the priest who would, would preside over the ceremony had achieved. Then, when you come to the front, you will also see that the robe, sort of, acts like a building in a second sense. The priest brings the temple with him. He steps into the robe. He has prepared his sacred space, and he is now he has now entered the gate. The color indicates the gate. And when you look at the le left and right um, parts of the extended color, you see that there is a white tiger and a blue or blue-green dragon. And you know, those are the protecting animals of West and East. As they are very often in temples, on the left and right side of the gate. So again, the robe as the uh, transportable temple that the, the uh, priest could step in and wear. And you also see that the front part, right and left of this robe, is not very decorated. You know, since this was commissioned and decorated by very fine masters, it could not have been money that stopped them from decorating the front. Because they had enough. If they could pay for the back, they could also pay for the front. But when you think what the priest would do, do movements with his hands, to support his prayers, a sign language that he and the initiates would know, then you see that the front part would move a lot. And nobody would see it because the audience was looking at his back. So it didn't need to be embroidered. It would also make it even more heavy and it would probably not last as long. So a mixture of pragmatic and sensible solutions here. The front, the color, the gate of the temple, of course, had to be and had to be fine and exquisite. But the parts of the garment that weren't seen or had to move a lot during his pacing didn't need to be as heavily decorated. Now, when you look at this piece, 
you see something much less elaborately executed. It's a vest with a Taoist background, and as I mentioned, those of you who are very uh, trained in symbolism, they see there is the swastika uh, emblem embroidered here onto the vest that is actually taken from Buddhism. So you see that this very strict division between religions as we can know it, especially in monotheistic religions, you can only be a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, you can't be Jewish and Christian simultaneously. That's just mutually exclusive. In the Chinese world, in the wider world of Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism for that matter, that didn't matter at all. Take the best of everything. And the syncretism is visible in this set of symbols that this culture produced. This vest is probably from the mid 1970s and is made for a Yao priest and the Yao are a, in Chinese diction, national minority, one of the many. But uh, Yao live not only in southwest China, they also live in northern Vietnam, in Laos, and in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Which, of course, is a matter of fate that uh, brought them there. And they identify through their Taoist religion as a cultural set of symbols, as Yao. And that's why this vest, when you look at it closely, and those of you who read Chinese characters will see this very cl clearly, has all the emblems that uh, our Taoist priest's vest used to have, like the Tower of the Immortals, and dragons, and the three deities that preside over a ritual that you would find on a makeshift altar. But then there are also inscriptions, and some of the characters are very clearly readable, and some are not, because most likely the person who embroidered the inscription didn't know Chinese anymore. They followed a model, whether that was a print or the previous garment that may not have been preserved as well, it was copied and then transferred onto this vest. If you ask me about the significance of these registers of persons and what they individually mean, I have to tell you, I don't know. There are registers where it's easy to identify, like the second from the bottom, because there are characters indicating that these are the deities that, pre, that uh, signify and have efficacy over the five, uh, um, the symbols of the, the five phases of change, or the five elements. But when you look at the other registers, and especially the ones that look pretty fierce, sort of having weapons and animal heads and human bodies that look like hell creatures or uh, protectors, or maybe hell officials who are there to punish, as you might find them in Buddhist iconography. How did they get to reach a rank higher than the deities of the five elements? I don't know, frankly. Jerome, any idea, maybe? <laughs> I don't want to transfer responsibility here, but I, I've <laughs> thought about this a lot and uh, I can't come to a conclusion. But there are, of course, elements that we, that we can identify very clearly with Taoism, like um, the, the hexagrams from the eating, and then there is this dragon fish at the bottom of the register. So everything is nicely done in symmetry and with 
quite a bit of loan from um, Buddhism and probably other influences that pertain to shamanistic ideas among the Yao that didn't necessarily have representation in standard Taoist, if one can talk about standard Taoist uh, vestments. But it's interesting to see that Taoism has prevailed and prevails to this day. The second, um, second best natural product to watch out for if you want to achieve longevity is the peach. Peaches of immortality grow in the garden of the Queen Mother of the West and they only ripen every thousand or in other texts every three thousand years. So we have to be very persistent to prevail that long. But in the other world, maybe we will be invited to a banquet with the Queen Mother of the West and then grab a peach of immortality or a slice thereof and then it's immortality from then on. The eight immortals are present. Of course, they meet again and again in paradise. What else do you have to do than have nice banquets? And you see also that uh, other iconographic symbols that you know from painting, like the pine tree, which is, of course, a symbol of everlasting friendship, or again, the deer show up here, or up here, all these little scenes show interesting details. There is a gourd, and the gourd sits on top of a little stove. You see the attendant blowing with a little bellow air into the fire so that the potion, the good potion that is being stored in the double gourd doesn't get cold until it's consumed by these uh, illustrious people. Oh, immortals, not people. Yeah, that's, uh, that peach has a name in the museum. I will not repeat it here because the shape reminds me of something <laughs> else. But it's a huge peach. Gives lots of immortality for those who, <laughs> who get to eat it. Not necessarily, no. No, but uh, you're right. I mean, this peach ripened long and uh, has to be carried by two persons. That, that shows its quality. When you look at this hanging here, the, the cursor, you see, again, immortals meeting. See how the terrace looks somewhat similar? The way this is divided, the, the image itself is divided into different sectors. The guests arriving, there is also somebody with a double gourd and some very interesting um, he leaving the gourd, if you come very close, you can see that in this stream of good scent, there are five bats. Five bats come out and sail on the stream. So what do the bats stand for? You know it. Longevity. <laughs> 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 and then, of course, if you come even a little closer and you see the deity of longevity with his nice uh, robe that has the character for long life on it, has a deer that very patiently carries him. And if you look at its antlers, you have to come very close, then you see they are made of magic mushrooms. <laughs> so this deer is very special. Now this illust illustrious society of eight immortals you see also on these long um, stretched hangings that I was so thrilled that we could actually th show both of these 
because when Anne and I looked at the, the size of these textiles and then had to think about space and how to display them, then she said, well, let's look at the condition. And some of you know that we had a conservator here two years ago, Beth Suhai from the Bay Area came, looked at all the textiles, and she actually also conserved two of the robes very, very finely. And so we thought, let's look at the condition. What did Beth say? Which one would actually be the best to show to everybody? And then once we had them spread out, we thought, oh, how would it be if we could show them both? You know, then you get greedy because you think one is beautiful because it has this very unusual ground, the, the patterned uh, background that I have never seen before, but I'm not an art historian. So the art historians may have seen this before, but uh, for me, this was a very unusual piece, but also in the way the distribution of the immortals was arranged and then the God of Longevity in the center with the crane and you know it, the deer, of course. And then in comparison, you see this um, long stretched hanging with a celebration that reminds very much of our three hangings in the back that celebrates a couple that is shown in the center. And whether it's their anniversary or a birthday of one of the two, this elder couple is honored by a group of well-wishers, might be actors, like in the hanging that we have on the left there, who actually might have performed in honor of this couple. It might be relatives dressed up, well-dressed, to present their congratulations. But again, when you look at all the little details around the main actors, you find cranes and you find deer. So the iconography that belongs to wishing well and wishing for a long life is repetitive. You find it again, and that makes, makes it count to the category of celebration of long life, celebration of longevity, and association with these Taoist values. A life well lived, a life not interfering with the nature given to you or somebody else, a life lived in balance, so hard to do, that leads to longevity. Question. Question. I read something about how they get the gold mm -hmm. around the thread. Or I, could yeah. you explain that? Oh, yeah. Technology. So gold is expensive. Gold is also heavy. But you also know that you can hammer gold so fine Everybody who has been to Thailand and has seen how devotees attach leaf gold to a statue knows that. So how do you get that much gold into an embroidery? There are basically two techniques. One is to have to hammer the gold very, very fine, and then to back it with paper and cut it in extremely fine strips and then couch it, meaning laying it into the form, like the discs on our robes, laying it into the form you want to achieve and attaching it with tiny, tiny stitches to the surface of the garment. So you will, when you later have time and walk around, take a look at the discs in the back, I think that is, those are the clearest examples. The other possibility is the one you just mentioned. You have a silk thread called the sole of the embroidery thread in that gold, finely cut gold uh, strip is wound around the silk sole. 
and that is then used for the embroidery. So it is an enormous amount of work and it requires great skill and mastership. And as you will see when you look at the details, we truly have absolute masterpieces in front of us here. Some of the iconography, and Rose looks at her hands, is that, are we, am I, to, we should move along. Okay, let's move along. In the Jade case, you will see some of the iconography again, very finely carved into the most precious stone that uh, was revered. So the scepter called Rui, may everything be as you wish. When you look at this closely, you see Peaches of Immortality decorating this Rui. And if you give something like that as a gift, it of course will mean that uh, your position in this well-deserved office may be there for you for a long life. Enjoyed to the, to the best of your capacities. And uh, there is a little triptych with three Taoist deities and this little water basin has the shape of a peach, but um, yeah, the, the shape of a peach and has the, the branches and leaves of the peach freshly picked. The same, when maybe we should move all the way to beyond our curio wall here um, to the big rock that I asked Anne, can we please take it out of the wall of Emperor Tianlong's favorite pieces? Because if it's carved in the front, it's probably also carved in the back. And finally, the case was opened, the rock came out, and we can see now the carvings on both sides. If you look at the front here, you see the Queen Mother of the West celebrating. And she is looking at two um, youngsters holding the symbol of yin and yang in their hands between them in this little basin. So this could be gold, golden boys and jade maidens. Those are the attendants who always accompany the Queen Mother of the West. I can't really see which of the two are indicated here. And the back of the rock is actually also very interesting because what it shows is an animal that you will look at and say, this is not a dragon, this is not a lion, this is not a horse, this is something mythical, exactly. A composite animal that appears from the floods and carries on its back a disc with the hexagrams of the eating, the book of change, the book of changes, and reminds us of the script of the river that is said to have appeared during the script of the river, a scroll and um, an emblem which are said to appear only in the most peaceful times when the perfect ruler appears. Well, we have one in the museum. Gertrude Bas Horner made it possible. And if you look closely, you will also find again the pine tree, the symbol of long friendships. And you will see a lot of clouds and they have the shape of magic mushrooms. You can't evade them. 
This is our most modern, no, this is not, this is one of two very modern pieces. And it's a photography by Yang Yong Liang. And Anne and I try to interpret this. So when you get close, you see this huge mountain, which could resemble the mountain of the immortals, where they reside, is actually full of activity that destroys nature. So when you look at this very closely, you see there's a highway going up all around the mountain, all the way to the top, and there are clouds of pollution and cranes and people tumbling on a long rope in mid-air without being able to save themselves. Here's a huge construction crane, all presumably in the process of destroying paradise. The paradise that we have been given that we can all enjoy if only we understand where we live. I also am reminded of looking at this uh, photograph that is then magically altered by the artist. By, of, I'm reminded of a huge rock that Emperor Qianlong has been given. And if you have been to China and you travel to Beijing and you have visited the National Museum, previously the History Museum, then you come to get to see this huge rock, this is as tall as I am, all jade, and it's on a pedestal, so it's actually much taller than I am. And you see the story of the great Yu, this mythical ruler who brought order to China by taming the waves. It's sort of a... Um, a proverb talking about his activities. He brought China peace and order by taming the floods. And people say, that's the legend. For 13 years, he created dams and he tried to bring order to this wild nature to help China be prosperous and governable. The rock has exactly the shape of what uh, Yang Yong Liang shows us here. And it shows the activity of humans helping the Great Yu, getting China in order. And I always think maybe he wants to show us that they did a little too much so that this order in the Confucian sense or the natural order in the Taoist sense is very precariously threatened, hopefully not destroyed. But uh, if we move further to the end here, then you have more of the symbolism, the set of symbols that I mentioned in the beginning that is not only used by Taoism, but reappears. This poster from the Cultural Revolution that celebrates the contributions of all national minorities, the Koreans and the Mongols and the Manchus, and everybody is dancing and singing so nicely. And what do they carry in the center? Pages of immortality. And of course, Mao Zhuxi, the great uh, Helmsman is celebrated and he is like the sun and he is not quite immortal. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last um, modern piece that we see here is actually very dear to my heart and I will give the microphone to Anne in a moment so that she can explain to you what, is, what else is behind this. So this is by Leo Hong, an artist who lives in Oakland, who has been, who is a Chinese-American artist, born in China, was educated during the Cultural Revolution, learned 
how to paint propaganda poster large scale, murals, posters, you name it, she can do it all. And as a fairly tragic 